Great, thank you. So welcome everyone um, to our UCL Graduate Open event. Um, we're going to be talking today about the MSc in Physics and Engineering in Medicine by Distance Learning. Um, and uh, it's, it's nice to meet you all. My name is uh, Billy Dennis. I am the Distance Learning Tutor in the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering. Um, I'm also the Postgraduate Taught Programs Deputy Director, so I oversee our other uh, MSc and MS programs as well. Um, someone who you might have met last week if you came to our talk about, the, about our other MSc and MRS programs was uh, Professor Elias Taxidis. He is the Postgraduate Taught Programme Director, so he oversees everything including our distance learning course. Um, So some other people that you might meet um, if and when you're joining our program might be uh, Professor Andy Nisbet, who is our de head of department. Um, I've already described uh, Ilias and myself. And then there's uh, Dr. Martin Fry, who's the postgraduate admissions tutor. So he's the person you'll be sending your applications to, making the case for joining the program. Um, on top of that, some two other important people to see are Dr. Katharina Vega, who's the organizers the research projects for the department in postgraduate uh, programs. Um, so someone that you're going to be encountering a lot as when you do your research projects in your final year. And then uh, Hallie Cook, who's our senior teaching and learning administrator, who uh, handles all of the admin responsibilities for, for the courses, selecting modules and exams and all kinds of other things like that as well. So uh, you'll get a chance to meet them, hopefully, at some point uh, when, you, in, when and if you decide to join us. Um, just like to start with a little discussion about the department in general. Um, Ilias covered a lot of this in his talk last week uh, when we discussed all the postgraduate programs. But um, so if you want to look more, you can you can uh, see what he said there. I think that video will be on YouTube. Um, the main strength of the department, and this is a focus of, of many departments here at UCL, is that we are really a research led department. We produce excellent research and that's uh, that's what you'll be exposed to in terms of teaching and in terms of the research projects you'll be doing as part of your master's course. Um, another advantage of our department is that we're relatively a uh, small number of students compared to the number of researchers, which means that you get more personal time with the researchers when you're studying with us. And so equally, we know our students very well. We're very proud of that. And uh, particularly on the distance learning course where you get a bit more personal tuition than, uh, than many other programs here at UCL. You know, we're very proud to get to know our students and uh, and sort of advance their careers through, through the uh, MSc programs. And then lastly, being that we're a department with uh, strong clinical applications, um, we've got lots of links to local hospitals here in London. London's a city with you know, a wide variety of, of uh, large hospitals and smaller institutions that cover specialisms in, in clinical care. And uh, our research groups and our teaching uh, integrate nicely into all of those different uh, hospitals and departments. So that's another, the, the sort of key strengths of our course and program is that are these three things. So a quick tour of the numbers in our department of, uh, of the people here. We've got around 50 academic staff who are permanent, including six teaching specialists, of which I'm one. Um, on top of that, we've got around 120 postdoctoral research staff. So those are the people that will organize your research projects and perhaps teach you through your courses. Um, on top of that, um, we have around 270 undergraduate students um, in, in mostly in two different programs, the medical physics program and the biomedical engineering research, uh, undergraduate programs. And then we have about 90 postgraduate taught students total, which includes students studying physics and engineering and medicine, but also uh, newer programs that will be set up in the last years in, uh, in artificial intelligence and medical robotics and medical imaging as well, as well as our MRES programs. And then on top of that, we've got about 180 PhD students. So you can see the ratio again of, of numbers of research uh, staff and students is, is very high. And so hopefully that's a, for some of you, that may be a, a, a career progression for you to think about. Our research groups have sort of touted how, how strong they are and how we're very proud of it. Um, these are a sort of a, a not all encompassing list of the different research groups that, that, that you'll find in our department. Um, 
particularly strong in most of these areas. Medical imaging is a, is a major focus here in the departments and lots of different modalities are included in that. MRI, ultrasound, uh, optical techniques, as well as uh, electrical impedance tomography and even some electron microscopy in there as well. The radiation physics groups uh, that look at X-ray imaging, as well as uh, radiotherapy treatments, cancer treatments generally, and, and other advanced radiation effects. Um, we also have groups that look at implanted devices that you might use on, on patients, etc., including electrical stimulators and neuromodulation, which is uh, stimulating parts of the brain to uh, accept perhaps more drugs or activate certain areas of the brain. And also uh, a large group that looks at optical and photoacoustic monitoring of the body, um, which can cover a wide range of areas. Um, computing is a major part of the department as well, naturally, um, as we as we advance into sort of the 21st century now, we're looking more and more at techniques that can make use of that high processing power of computers uh, to make ourselves faster and do more than we've ever done before. And so that in, actually all of these groups tend to integrate amongst all the other research topics. There are some pure computing groups in the department, but some most of them are applied in terms of taking the techniques of, of advanced AI and uh, and imaging uh, processing and taking it into these sort of applied methods of perhaps radiotherapy or all, all these different groups. So there's a wide range of different research being done here. And these are all subjects that you might be interested in as you study an MSc with us or take your research projects. Just to give you a quick history of the program, first of all, the origins of our MSc program come from 1958, which was the uh, world's at the time, the world's first master's degree in radiation physics, which was based at the University of London. It was response to the windscale fire disaster that happened here in the UK, which was a nuclear power station fire that led to radiation outputs that was uh, uh, very famous in the news at the time. Um, and one of the one of the fathers of our department, really the father figures of our department, Sir Joseph Rockblatt, was um, was essential in setting up a, a radiation physics program that had an aim of having a sort of hum more humanitarian outputs. Um, so Joseph Rotblatt is famous for getting the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, um, to do with his uh, leadership of the nuclear disarmament uh, campaigns and treaties across the world. And so although he worked on the nuclear bomb in the, uh, in the United States in the Second World War, um, he was the only scientist to actually leave that program based on ethical issues. And he then pursued a career into humanitarian uses of radiation physics, which sort of led to the medical programs in, in some way that we found here uh, in London. So we were based at the University of London over the years. UCL has merged with a number of the different departments, uh, the Middlesex uh, Hospital, UCLH, um, uh, to form our current department. So the prestige and the origins of that course, the, the knowledge that was passed down and the people who taught it are based from this original course. Um, in 2011, the distance learning route that I'm gonna be talking about today was opened, designed to replicate the on-campus MSc, but online. Um, the purpose being to allow students who needed more flexible circumstances um, to be able to study the MSc as well without having to come to London. And our first graduates were in 2013. Um, at the time, we only had part-time students. Although in recent years, we have a good mix now of part-time and full-time distance learning students. Um, in 2015, we were accredited by the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine, IPEM, which is uh, currently the only distance learning course in the UK to be accredited. That is still the case. It was in 2015. We've just been re-accredited re last month by IPEM for another uh, term of three to five years. Um, and so we're still currently the only the distance learning course uh, that have been accredited by them. And then some little notifications here in 2018 and 2019, we received UCL teaching awards for personal uh, tutoring and um, so we're very proud of the provision that we also provide for our distance learning students. We've been running this program for around yeah, 12 years as you can see now. We're very experienced at, um, at giving good support to our students and uh, our students do very well at the end of the day. Um, many of the marks and the, the, that the students get when they graduate are as good and better as any of the students here on campus and we've had um, 
the MSc Best Student Award given to distance learning students twice in the last five years. So hopefully that might be one of you in the future as well. Um, a quick overview of, of the programme. So the, um, fit the, the degree title is MSc Physics and Engineering and Medicine by Distance Learning. And this is actually the Radiation Physics, the IPEM accredited stream of our MSc here. We've got engine, biomedical engineering streams and there's radiation physics stream, but the distance learning program is the radiation physics stream. In terms of time to complete the degree, um, a large uh, emphasis and a large strength of the program is that you can study it flexibly. This means uh, in a number of different ways, but the first way is the time you can take to complete your MSc. If you study it full time, then you'll complete the degree in one year. So starting in September this year, you'd finish by August 2024. Uh, a common way that students study it is to split that over two years. This might be for a student who's working full time in a job. Um, it's got some support perhaps from their job, some time for them to spend studying or they're studying in their evenings and weekends. Um, and that's called part time. So you complete the degree over two years, spreading the module study out over that time. And then, as I said, the degree is fully flexible. And so we've got this up to five years maximum flexible study option where you can choose any number of modules that you might want to study each year. Um, and and it, it's flexible. So if you maybe take three modules in your first year and then second year, you suddenly have a situation in your life, which means you can't study that year. You can take a year out and study again in your third year, fourth year, and then complete the degree later. It's fully flexible. You can choose any number of modules each year. And it's just there for those students with more complicated circumstances that normal university uh, programs wouldn't be able to support you to complete your studies. So this is a major strength of the, of the program allowing you to complete your studies when, uh, when you may, might not have been able to otherwise. Um, studying by distance learning, you can study alone. <laughs> Many students will do this. You'll feel like this sometimes, perhaps sitting at home or your computer studying. Um, but there's also group work as part of the MSc as well. And we encourage our students to interact with inter each other as much as possible, get a bit of a collaborative atmosphere for you guys to learn together. Um, it's up to you as a student, ultimately. There is one module, which I'll talk about a bit later, that requires you to work in a group with other students. Um, but generally, it gives you that flexibility so you can study at your own pace and complete your work when you're, when you're ready to. On top of that, there's opportunities for you to visit UCL's campus uh, here in London and come and speak to our lecturers, come and speak to the supervisors, or to come and uh, get some clinical work experience at some of our partner hospitals and clinics. Um, that's still open to you as a distance learning student, um, by no means compulsory. Many of our students are, live in countries that are a long way from the UK, so perhaps that isn't ideal, but there's still opportunities for you to do that, even though you are a distance learning student. So a quick example of the kind of student profiles that we might see, and perhaps this will be, you'll be able to see yourselves as some of this in some of these profiles. So this first student is a typical example of someone studying perhaps part-time, Charlotte. Um, she's got a background in a physics degree, and she's currently working full-time in a hospital as a clinical scientist in training. So if you're looking to get a career in the hospital as a medical physicist, then this is perhaps what this is what Charlotte is as well. So she's interested in using the degree to gain her certificate uh, as a hospital clinical scientist. And so work are giving her perhaps one day off a week or sometimes not even that. And so she's going to study MSc part-time and complete in two years a very common one. And we've actually got uh, one of our current students who fits this profile, who's going to talk to us a bit later uh, about his experience uh, with this with this career route. Uh, next, we might be like Wei Ren here, who's perhaps got a background not in physics, but in mechanical engineering. So we've got students of lots of different backgrounds join our program. Um, they might be working in a full time job again, so they need the flexibility of studying by distance learning or with a few number of modules per year. But they've got less available study time than Charlotte. So rather than completing the MSc over two years, uh, Wei Ren's going to take a third year studying slightly fewer modules each year, but still allowing himself to complete the program then. So in which case he'd study on the three year or on the flexible program. And this might be typical of some of our students who are not currently working in in uh, clinic environments, but are looking to change their career and join the subject area of medical physics and biomedical engineering. 
And then finally, perhaps Vichy is more like you, someone with a computer science or engineering related degree. Um, they're not working full time, but they're looking for the flexibility of being able to study at home that comes with distance learning. And maybe there's a financial aspect as well. We realize it's quite expensive coming to move to London, live in London for a year while studying. So you can save a good amount of money by studying by distance learning and still get the exact same qualification and get a really good experience out of it as well. So Vichy might be not necessarily looking for a career path in hospitals, but might be thinking about becoming a researcher. So perhaps in that case, the one year MSc full time would be the best option. And so these are perhaps the three most common examples of students who join our MSc programme by distance learning. Uh, just a quick note about flexible study. I've said this a few times uh, already, but the, the aim of the programme is to really give every student the opportunity who would not normally be able to, to study and complete an MSc in a specialist area that they're interested in. So the program is designed to be fully flexible. You can join the course with that up to maximum five year program, as I said, and choose any number of modules each year. How it works is that you would enroll on new modules in September at the start of each year, and you commit to those modules. So you might say, right, you meet with me at the start of the year and, you, and we have a discussion about how much study time you have, you think per week available, and then I'll recommend the number of modules you take. And then you, you study those for that year. You don't, need to commit to year two or year three or year four you can decide at the start of each September how many modules you'd like to take that academic year so as life circumstances change I don't know maybe you need to take some maternity leave maybe you change job and there's been a change in work pressures then you can change your plans as well in terms of numbers of modules um, generally for our students um, that option of doing up to four or five years is used as a backup where the, a student might need it to take a year out or where they really need to slow down their study rate um, due to available study time. But there are students who plan from the start to do five years um, and, and take a, a smaller number of modules each year. Finally, so that's a, one flex, flexible aspect of study, but another major one is that the entire degree is available asynchronous study, which means that you study at different times asynchronous, meaning that you don't need to attend any live lecture here in London or online. You can study entirely what time suits you. So for a student who's in working a normal job, they can study their lectures at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. in the evening, and that's absolutely fine. It's asynchronous, meaning that those materials are always available for you to study when you'd like. And I'm gonna talk about exactly how that works in a bit. The modules of the MSc, I thought I'd just quickly explain, you've got the list of modules here that you will need to complete to complete your degree. Um, Given that there are students with different uh, study paths, some studying over one year or two years or three years, as I said, we have a recommended route where we recommend that students in their first year, no matter what, will take the ionizing radiation physics and the medical imaging with ionizing radiation modules. Those modules include some foundational materials that are, will be useful in the future modules that you study later in future years. Um, and then in your final year, we recommend that's the year that you take your master's research project, your individual project, and uh, your group research project, which is this medical device enterprise scenario, with the aim being that you've learned all the material you have in your modules, and then you're applying it into your research project. So you take those research projects last. And then in the middle here will depend on your circumstances, but you've got an options of which modules you'd like to take in which year. So maybe if you were studying the MSc in a single year, you'd take all of these modules in one go. If you're studying over two years, then you'd start with these first two modules. And then you could choose biomedical optics and MRI. You could choose computing and medicine. You could choose biomedical ultrasound. You can choose the modules that you would like in each individual year. And, and sort of make your decisions based on that. How does a typical year work studying by distance learning? Well, I thought I'd take you through the whole process from sort of start in September to the end of your exams. Um, you start off in September here at UCL, we, we tend term center start actual lectures start in October each year. So September's an induction time. Uh, during that month, you'll meet your course mates online and you'll meet your personal tutor, which at the moment is me. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion about how much study time you've got and you'll choose your modules for the year, picking out which ones you think you'd be most interested in. 
And then the induction program itself includes um, a, a tutorial basically that teaches you the basics of how uh, the course works studying by distance learning. Um, there are more and more uh, students with experience in distance learning in recent years, partly due to the pandemic, where I know a lot of university courses had to sort of emergency come up with a with a way of studying online when we couldn't meet up in person. Um, that is likely to be slightly different to how we study here on the course. As I say, our MSc was designed from the start to be a distance learning program. So we put in a lot of extra provisions to look after you and to make methods to help you study that we know succeed. So this induction will give you a taste of how to do that basically. And rather than just tell you about it, you'll learn by doing by me giving you a tutorial exercise for you to complete. As part of that tutorial exercise, you'll be required to watch some lecture videos and study those, take some notes. You'll be required to go to the UCL online library, find some research textbooks uh, or some research papers that will help you solve some problems. Um, you'll be asked to collaborate with your peers, uh, your fellow distance learning students, and I'll show you the different ways that we communicate with each other and make it easy for you to talk to your fellow students, even if you know, you're working in a full-time job and therefore might not be available at the same time. Um, and it'll give you an example of solving some problems. So this tutorial is an exercise where then you'll answer some questions and you'll submit that work online. I'll then mark it. I'll pass it back to you and give you some feedback. And then we meet to discuss any problems you had with the, with the course. And by doing this introduction tutorial, you'll get a good idea of all the sort of techniques you'll need to study successfully by distance learning. So that's just our induction. It doesn't count for anything, that induction, but it's just showing you the course in the first sort of week of term. Then week by week, how does it work studying? So when October starts, we start to get into the, the modules themselves and the lecture materials. Um, Broadly, each module is divided up into subtopics, um, which are based around the recorded lecture videos that are done every year here on campus on the same MSc program. Um, so these topics uh, give you a nice guide of, of, what, of, of, of what you need to complete each week, essentially. So we give you this weekly study guide that you can see on this little diagram at the right here. Uh, gives you the week plan on the 7th of October, you're supposed to complete the lectures on photon interactions. And by the 2nd of December, you're doing proton interactions. You can see week by week, we break down each module into small chunks. So you know, I need to watch this lecture and I need to study these materials and complete these exercises. So roughly, if you're part-time studying on the MSc, then it's around one to two hours of videos, lectures per module per week. If you're full time, you need to double this. But that, it's worth saying that um, that's only a, that's only a part of your studies on the MSc. We do not recommend studying passively, <laughs> passive learning where you just watch a video or you just read a textbook is not one of the better ways of learning something. It's not the best way of memorizing or developing new skills. Much better is for you to take an active approach by having something that you do with the knowledge that you've just learned. So you watch a video and then you do an activity which will help solidify your understanding. So a major part of the course as well as the lecture videos are these self-study problems. Um, these are opportunities for you to share work with other students and get feedback uh, on, on, on your understanding from the tutor. So here's an example of one of our little forums where a student has uh, submitted a little piece of work here. You can see they've marked themselves anonymous, so uh, you don't need to even admit that it was you, <laughs> perhaps if you're worried about the quality of your work. And they said, please have a look and comment, thanks. So they've uploaded this little ultrasound example. I'll go in there and give them some feedback on it. And other students can see that at the same time. You can talk to each other, and hopefully solve problems together and work through your problems. So that's one of the things we encourage you to do to, to stay active in your studying. As well as the lecture videos, there are additional reading and online eBooks and, and research papers and exam papers for you to have a look at as well. They'll help you sort of round out your understanding after you've, after you've studied a topic. And it's worth saying that the variable study rate is pretty normal um, with our students. So if you, with, particularly with part-time students, but often with sometimes with full-time students as well, you've joined our distance learning program to give you the flexibility 
that you need to study each week. So if you miss a lecture or if you find that you're very busy one week, um, you can easily catch up hopefully later. So as I said, variable study note is normal, but to keep you on target for the exams at the end of the year, the things that count, um, there are three tutorial deadlines that are your checkpoints to uh, complete your studies as you study throughout the year. So let's have a quick look at those. So each module that you'll study has three fixed tutorial review tasks. So you'll do one in November, one in February, and then one in March. Um, and these are very similar to the kind of tutorials that I described from the induction program. They sometimes count towards your final module mark, um, but often they are actually informal or uh, formative exercises where they're just there to help solidify your understanding and to, you know, to give you the education which will be useful for you in your future careers. There are a range of tasks you'll see there. So some are direct mathematical problem solving. Some of them are literature reviews. Some of them are data analysis uh, using research uh, data. Some of them will be using pieces of research software and doing a bit of programming as well, um, computer programming. And then some are exam question paper practice. So there's, there's main aim, the main aims with these tutorials is, first of all, to solidify your understanding of the material you've just studied. Um, second of all, to make sure that you are prepared for your assessment so you can get really good marks at the end of it. We obviously care about you, you, you doing well in your degree. I'm sure you do. And then finally, to give you this sort of rounded education that you can use in future. And some of that, the easiest, <laughs> the easiest application of that will be in your master's research projects in your final year but it actually applies to everything. So when we're teaching you things, asking you to do exercises about literature reviews or using a research software, we're trying to give you tools that you can use later. And they may not be directly related to an assessment you do on the course, but they're hopefully something that's very useful for you as you study. So again, all of these exercises you submit, they're marked by myself and then they'll be returned to you. And then we have a meeting the following week again, where we review the exercise. I answer any questions you guys, you have got about any of the problems and uh, we can just review generally how you're doing on the course. So these regular checkpoints are a really nice way um, for you to check whether you've understood everything and whether you're gonna succeed on the course. Um, so we found that with the students that keep up with these, um, they're the students who do really well on the course. It's worth saying that although these are sort of fixed tutorials and in the schedule, these are not the only opportunities for you to speak with me, your tutor. At, I'm available throughout the year and often I have relationships with my students where I'll have regular email conversations with them uh, on a weekly basis. It sort of depends student to student. Um, if you've got a small problem, perhaps, oh, I didn't understand that concept the lecturer said, I'm working on this problem sheet and I don't know how to do it. We'll have regular conversations by email. Some students will email me and say, can we have a chat in person, usually online, and, uh, and discuss a particular problem. That's all fine as well. These checkpoints are just there to make sure that you're keeping up with the material as much as anything else. But if you've got extra issues you'd like to discuss and, under and gain understanding, you can always, uh, ask for an extra tutorial so it's worth saying that's not limited these are two examples of uh, an example of the tutorials you might be given so this was a tutorial that's using filtering in the frequency domain so a way of doing an image processing tool to uh, to find some extra information out from that image and then uh, doing some more complicated morphological operations on an electron microscope microscope picture here of, uh, of a series of nerve cells. Um, so there's a wide range of activities you'll find here, hopefully very interesting and hopefully very useful. Um, great, and, um, and then at the end of the year, you'll have your most of your assessments, so your exams in term three, which are generally set in May or June. Um, in term three. So these exams uh, should be identical to the on-campus exams that are taken by students that study here in London. And they're usually set in a local exam center to you, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, if you live in, the, in England, then you'd be expected to come here to London. Some exams, the, the world of assessments is slightly changing at the moment due to the, due to the pandemic, sort of where we, where we had a lot of exams moved online. There's a mix currently of, of exams that are being taken online and a mix of exams that are being taken in person. So uh, it's usually one of those two, but I, I, I can't tell you for sure what next year will be uh, exactly, but it will be the same assessment that you take uh, if you were a student studying in person here in London. 
Um, most modules have also got a small coursework uh, component in them. That's usually around 20% of the module that you take uh, during the study year. So not in, not at the end of uh, term, uh, not, not in term three. Um, these courseworks are usually integrated into your tutorial exercises. So uh, we're not trying to overassess you. The most coursework, the reason we have them in courses is to give you an opportunity to check your understanding as you study during the year. And so it's, it's serving a lot of the same purposes as the tutorials. So sometimes you'll find there's a coursework in place of one of those main tutorials instead. Research projects. So this is something, again, you do in your final year of study. And there's two main research projects you'll do. One is your individual research project, which is worth four taught modules. So it's four times the weight of a normal module. So it's a big component of the MSc. And then there's also the group research project that you'll do called the medical device enterprise scenario. I'll start with the uh, individual projects. There's two main ways that distance learning students will take research projects. They, uh, depending, it, it really comes down to the opportunities you've got in your local environment. So if you're one of those students that already works at a hospital, then it makes good sense to actually develop a local project at your hospital, or you do a piece of research that really impacts what your currently, your job is. Um, so that's one opportunity. And then the idea is that we develop that project with you and we find a specialist here in the department who's who's got the same expertise that you'll need to give you the support and go through the project. And so you get a supervisor, hopefully locally in your workplace, and then you get a supervisor here from UCL in the department. The second uh, chance for you to do a research project is just to sign up to the list of master's project proposals that are given every year here in, here in the department. In September, academics in the department are asked to propose master's research projects that will be based on their own work, obviously. And then you just apply for those projects as if it was a job, basically. So you can join those lists. Many of those projects you'll be able to study, even though you are distance learning, they probably won't involve uh, data collection and they may not involve direct action with patients, but there'll still be a, no a number of projects in there which will be appropriate for a distance learning student. So those are the two main ways, find a local project or just do a project with us at UCL. The Individual project has uh, assessments throughout the year that are sort of like our tutorials, giving you regular checkpoints, reports that you write to make sure that you're steadily working throughout the year as well. And then hopefully like any of our students really, particularly, but particularly at master's level, we're looking for you to do, you know, novel, excellent research that you could publish and share elsewhere. And many of our students on, on the master's programs do stay for a PhD and we're, we're often, you should not discount that probability for yourself or possibility for yourself if you are studying distance learning. Finally, you'll also have your group research project, which is called the medical device enterprise scenario. This is a group project where you as distance learning students will be working in a group with the students here on campus. It's usually a group of around six students, five or six students. Um, at the start of the year, we give you a problem to solve. It might be a particular uh, area of need in our subject area. And when you're asked to make an invent, not sorry, not make, but to invent a new medical device that can solve that problem in some way. Um, in your group, you'll have students with lots of different backgrounds. Some are mechanical engineers, some are electronic engineers, some might be computer scientists, some are physicists. And so between you, you've got a lot of uh, collective knowledge that you can actually bring to bear on the problem and come up with some really good solutions. Um, so you can see uh, here on the screens, uh, two examples of recent problems that were given to students. One was to make technology for the visually impaired or the hearing impaired. And this is an example of one of the devices they made that year. They made a braille mouse, which is very interesting, kind of like an electronic computer mouse, where they run this mouse over a, a book or any kind of writing, and it can read it and transpose it into braille using these small pins that you can see on the top of the mouse here. Those will be raised or they'll be lowered in order to translate what's being read underneath into braille. 
a really interesting device actually. Um, a couple of years ago when uh, COVID was much more uh, prevalent here in the UK, we also had a task to come up with COVID support devices for patients. And this is an example of a device that one group made, which was an electrical muscle stimulator that you applied to the abdomen to help uh, patients who were very weak from COVID and unable to cough up the um, sputum that they had perhaps in their lungs at the time. So this is the muscle stimulator that stimulates the muscles, contracts them and can support a weak patient, allowing them to hopefully cough uh, in a better way. So these are, you know, these are full research projects fully backed by the science that came from researching other people's work uh, and coming through all the details that are needed to make that device. The end of the project is you make a business plan that you could hand to an investor. Um, to make this medical device yourself. Um, as a distance learning student, it can be feel intimidating perhaps to not be in the same place as someone when you're working on a group project, but it's designed in such a way where every group member has their own individual responsibility in the group. So perhaps you'll be in charge of the device, perhaps you'll be uh, in charge of the finances of that device. Perhaps you'll be in charge of what legislation you need to pass, or you'll be looking at the, the rest of the market. Is this de device unique? And, uh, and what needs are there in the market? How many people could you sell this to? So although it's a group project, within that, everyone has their own responsibilities, and that allows you to, to, uh, to come together to, to make something really interesting. It's really your chance to apply all that you've learned into into a new creative area. So it's kind of unique in the MSc where we're not teaching you what to do here. This is very much your own project for you to take away and try and come up with something fantastic. You can see um, the picture on the left here is uh, a lecture that we gave at the start where we were going through the new problem task for the year. And we've got uh, Dr. Martin Fry on the screen who is joining online. And if you look at my laptop, you can see lots of people joining on Zoom as well. These are the distance learning students, as well as the students here on campus uh, attending the lecture at the same time. So we're very used to integrating you guys as distance learning students with our campus groups as well. Um, final few things. When you're thinking about your research projects, I mean, the hardest thing to do really is to work out what subject you're most interested in. It's such a broad subject area and many of you might have money interests, but if you're trying to come up with an idea specifically what you think would be best, one good way to do that, it would be to listen to the department's podcast, which is Röntgen's Radio, named after the man who discovered x-rays. Um, and there's a range of episodes there, interviews given with our researchers, and there's no prior knowledge required. You don't need to understand how ultrasound works to hear Dr. Ellie Martin talk about her amazing research. You can just listen to the episode and find out all you need. And there's a big range of those episodes there, and there'll be new ones coming out uh, over the coming year as well. So if you want to get an idea of what research topics might be interesting for you, I'd strongly recommend having a look at that. It's nothing too technical. It really is for interest, very friendly, interesting discussions. We try to make it like a radio uh, episode, really. The final thing to say, really, as a distance learning student is that you are still very much a member of the department. Um, and you've got full access to all the things that students do when they work on and they study on campus with us. Um, we want you to feel part of it. You can email and speak to your lecturers online. That's absolutely expected. Uh, you can join our monthly lunchtime research seminars and find out specifically what's being done in the department this month. You can use the UCL careers resources and support teams to find help yourself find jobs uh, for when you finish the course or during the course for, if you're a part-time student. And you can come and visit London and see the department, meet your professors, meet your research teams. Um, that's an opportunity for you all the time. You are a distance learning student, um, but you've got full opportunity to join UCL and join the campus uh, at any time you really like. Um, it doesn't even just include our department. There's so much interesting work being done here at UCL. It's a university in the top 10 of the world for the last 20 years or so. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for you, even outside of your studies, to, to, to learn about new things and get involved with new groups. Um, so I strongly encourage you to make use of that, even as an online uh, participant in the course. 
our careers team, I think I just quickly mentioned, are, are terrific here in the UCL engineering department. They really are super supportive. They'll find you jobs. They'll find you schemes for you to join. Uh, they'll help you with your CVs. They'll help you with your writing for applications, something that many engineers are not very good at. Um, we recommend you make use of them, basically. Um, what careers do our students go on to do? Well, in theory, anything, because an engineering degree allows you, says that you can apply problems into new areas, which is what any employer really wants. But typically, many careers from our master's programs, they will end up as clinical scientists in hospitals, which uh, is Matt's career goal we're going to talk to in a moment. Um, maybe a medical startup company. Uh, there are graduate schemes in the major medical companies that um, the radiotherapy device machines, perhaps it's on a medical imaging devices, etc. Um, many of our students, of course, uh, continue the research into PhD programs, either here at UCL or elsewhere. Um, and there's lots of opportunities for you, and you should consider those certainly as a as an online student. Finally, a couple of things about the course and how to get onto the course. Um, the entry requirements of the course, the minimum requirements are a 2-1 UK bachelor's degree or an overseas equivalent in, in physics, engineering, computer science, mathematics, or other closely related disciplines. So you can see we've got students with lots of different backgrounds in terms of their degrees. Um, students, if you do have a 2-2, um, we do consider uh, joining the course as well, in which case we may require you to uh, come for a short interview, a short online interview with us just to check whether you think this is the degree that's appropriate for you. Um, we're looking for students with, in that case, perhaps with a bit of extra experience where possible. Perhaps you've done some shadowing, perhaps you've done some, you've been working in hospitals uh, uh, recently as well. Some idea that you'll be suitable to study on the course. And then finally, um, the finance of the program um, the UCL course fees are, are up here. You can see um, for 23-24, um, some might be interested in the UK postgraduate student loan scheme. And there's also UCL scholarships that you can apply for on an individual basis um, on the UCL website. But if you go to our prospectus, you'll find links to both of these things there as well. And uh, that's the end of my presentation for the moment. Um, I will come back perhaps and ask uh, some questions that you guys have got. I'm just gonna, can see some questions are coming in in the chat already. But um, I think if we've got Matt Powell, who's one of our current students, uh, we might hear from him first. So uh, I'll stop sharing my screen for a moment. Matt, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here, hello. Hi, Matt, nice, nice to see you, thanks for coming. No worries. Um, so, um, Matt is one of our current MSc students. He's a first year on the part-time uh, track um, and he's currently working in a clinical environment. So Matt, could you perhaps start, introduce yourself and say what your current job is uh, before we get to the MSc? Yeah, sure. Um, like Billy said, my name's Matt. I'm currently working uh, in-house at the Valindra Cancer Centre in Cardiff as um, a trainee clinical scientist in radiotherapy physics, but not via the traditional um, STP training scheme route, um, but more of a, uh, an in-house um, approach via the route two or STP equivalent scheme. It's not yet decided, but yeah. Great. And so how, how did you come to join our MSc program? And clearly, oh, can you explain the significance of that for your career? Yeah. Um, the... I don't believe it's compulsory to study an MSc on the current scheme that I'm training under, but um, it's highly, highly recommended and very hard to do without that. Um, as Billy said, um, this MSc is the only IPEM accredited one in the country, and I personally found that really um, valuable and that reputation and that uh, standard of tutorship is really important in order for me to um, meet those research and development competencies of my training. Um, it was this this course was recommended to me um, by my uh, line manager here at work, but I was also aware of um, the reputation of UCL's course um, as being one of, if not the best. Great. Um, and could you perhaps tell us which modules you're studying this year, just for some context for everyone else? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm studying uh, four modules this year. I'm on the part-time two-year um, radiation physics stream. 
Um, so at the moment I'm studying the ionizing physics or ionizing radiation physics module, um, imaging with ionizing radiation, um, <clears throat> MRI and biomedical, biomedical imaging, sorry, and the clinical practice module. Um, and one thing I quite like about uh, this style of teaching um, is that, uh, sorry, the stream, the part-time stream is that all of the modules run um, concurrently, which Billy might have already mentioned, but um, previously my last, my experience of studying before this, this MSc was in my third year of uni at Lancaster during COVID where um, the modules weren't studied concurrently, but I quite like that so that they're all finishing around the same time before your exam period. You don't have to go back and trawl through your notes from a, a module that you studied, like, or that you finished studying at Christmas time. Yeah, great. As you, have you had a thought about, so next year you'll be doing your research project. Have you had a thought about, about that yet? And how um, I've been watching lots of trainees around me doing their research projects, but it certainly looks a, a very busy time of year and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but yeah, a little nervous as I'm sure everyone. You're planning to do a local might. one though, do you think? I believe so, yeah. Um, the uh, the staff here at um, Valindra are putting together some um, master's project titles uh, currently, I think. Um, so hopefully in the next few months, I should know what local opportunities I'll have. And I think I think that's the route I'll be going down, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, last question before perhaps we can see if uh, our attendees have got any questions. Um, do you have a favorite uh, module so far? Feel free to say my module. <laughs> um, Don't do that for it, yeah. <laughs> I, like you said, they're broken down into lots and lots of subtopics. Um, the one that's been most useful uh, for me so far in terms of like the relevance to the work I'm doing in radiotherapy here at work um, is your module. It, it's, it's as such probably more interesting, but I do really like, um, I found learning about MRI really useful. Um, sorry, really interesting. Um, something that I wouldn't thought I would enjoy as much as I have. And also in the second half of the clinical practice module, you start learning about um, a lot of um, standard anatomy, which I personally was really looking forward to. I quite like the biological side of things. So yeah, the only one I've not listed there is imaging, which I guess is a little bit mean, but uh, yeah, no, they're, they're all good. Yeah, there's got to be one, I suppose. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've got a question from Tim in the chat, which I think perhaps you might be able to help with as well. He said, um, would you say roughly for someone working full time that one day of of a working week could be dedicated to a part-time master's and this would be enough time for lectures excluding projects and coursework time. So I, I'll start off by saying that is one of the ways that students do study if they're part-time. If, if they've got that option with work, they can have the extra day, but many students don't do that. They only study in, so they work a five day normal week and then they have studies. But Matt, could you perhaps say your experience with this? <laughs> yeah. Um... Thankfully, my department have been really generous. I get, um, at the moment, Tuesdays um, every week allocated to, you know, my MSc study. And I, depending on the day, I usually will be able to ring friends, ring friends that whole time, but um, sometimes that's not always possible. But the one day a week is, um, depends, on, depends on the person, I guess, depends on how, um, how much you can or want to get done in that whole day. I've personally found that um, I'll, I'll do one day a week. I'll work that full day watching the lectures and um, doing the self-study problems and things like that. But then uh, it's difficult to estimate a number of hours. It varies week by week. But there, there is additional time that I spend watching lectures um, outside of that day, um, which I personally don't really find much of an issue. The, the content is directly relevant to my job and as such really interesting. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel much of a chore to spend. Um, I'll, I'll just stay behind at work a few, few hours after my shift ends or, you know, a Saturday morning or something like that. But it's, it doesn't, it's not much longer than, than one day, I don't think. 
yeah I think that that's generally I've from feedback from other students I'd say that's say that's fairly typical I mean it is it is a master's program still so in two years it's it's a busy it's going to be a busy two years and you'll need some focus certainly you'll need to take some personal time to study that's that's true of a full-time student actually as actually as well so it's not a nine to five job doing a master's uh, anyway it you know there's extra work required and it's a for that for that particular time it can be quite busy but um but yeah it's yeah, I guess that's a part of the course, um, the rigor as much as anything else. Um, great, another question saying, do you get access to the university libraries and workspaces as a remote student? Uh, I periodically do work in London and have family there, so could use time on campus effectively. Yes, that is true. You do, you do have access to that. So as a distance learning student, you actually don't get automatically a student card. We don't send you one because you need to be assigned your student card in person here in London. However, you don't need your student card to study by distance learning normally. If you want to come to campus in London, then you can come and get one. There's basically a building in the, in the open part of the campus where you get yourself a student card. And once you've got that, you've got full access to the whole of the university in terms of libraries, the students, uh, the student center, the main student center, where there's loads of study space for group work and things like that, but also our department and the research groups that are there as well. So yes, you, you absolutely can. And we've got distance learning students who do that on a fairly regular basis. We've even got a couple of students who work here in London. So although it's a distance learning student, but studying around the corner, <laughs> as it were, but they still need the flexibility due to their work. So it, that's something that we can provide them. Um, Next question was, would chemistry degree be considered? Uh, I currently work as a trainee clinical scientist, um, MPE. Uh, yes, yes, we do absolutely consider uh, people with chemistry degrees. Um, the, the main thing for you to look out for, really when joining the course, is to be aware that there is a significant mathematical component of the program. You'll need to be able to do problem solving uh, on, on a fairly mathematical way. It's not, you do not require the sort of intense uh derivations that you'll find in a physics degree however so a good understanding of basic mathematics of calculus uh exponential functions and generally problem solving is what the most important bit so chemistry degrees are definitely considered yeah and we've got students who've come from chemistry backgrounds uh, on the course this year um, okay all right I'll just see if there's any more questions there if anyone thinks of any questions in retrospect, feel free to get Billy to forward the questions to me or take my email and I'll answer any questions anyone thinks of, if need be. Yes, absolutely. There's there's details um, on our department website for where you can send emails to ask questions about the course. They'll generally come to me if you're a distance learning student, but it's all on the, on the prospectus page. So recommend having a look up there as well if you, uh, you've got any questions um, otherwise. I don't think, oh, wait a minute, there's one more question, great. Um, so in terms of the computing module, do we need any prior knowledge of a programming language, e.g. Python? So the answer to that is no. The module that you're referring to is computing in medicine. Um, that's a compulsory module on the course. Um, that is a course that teaches you to program in MATLAB to go from absolute basics up to some really quite advanced image processing tasks. Um, and so it's designed to be for students who've never programmed before. Actually, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I did this MSc myself, and I was the same. I've got a physics degree, I'd never done any coding, and I'd learned to code from that, and now I'm pretty familiar with, with the processes we need. In terms of Python, with the, there are a lot of people who use Python now, um, and there's lots of people who use MATLAB in, in our subject area, although they are very much sister languages, I find. So once you've learned to code in one, it becomes very easy to code in the other. So no prior knowledge required, absolutely. Uh, you know, that is, I would say, more than 50% of the students on that module have never coded before at all. Um, so that's the answer to that one. Matt, Matt's not done that one yet. I think that's next year, isn't it, for you, Matt? It is, yeah. And I, I too don't have, well, I did a little bit of Python at uni, but... Um not much that i can retain knowledge of or have practiced since then so um i'll yeah. be starting from fresh as well <laughs> yeah i mean i think a lot of people find it intimidating sometimes to do programming if they've never done it before but actually what it is is a window for you to see a new world of how to solve problems in in our subject area it's just it's a shortcut machine so once you've learned to do it and once you're into it it's actually really interesting and really i find it fun 
as well to do so uh yeah don't be afraid of programming it's going to be a major part of all of our lives in the technical engineering type subjects so uh, embrace it and you know take it on okay great um i don't think there's any more questions but if you do have them then you can email me uh naomi's kindly put the link in the chat for the email address to to make contact with us um other than that, you know, uh, good luck if you're going to make an application and you'd like a, uh, you'd like some advice, or if you're worried about it, then you can email us as well, um, and uh, you know, have a have a good time. There's there's the deadline for the course is the 30th of June, so you do have some more time. But I would advise applying earlier if you can. Um, you know, there's a certain number of places on the course, and there will be. Uh, there's some administrative things for you to get through as well. But um, if you've got questions, again, do send it to us. Other than that, thank you very much for attending and um, hopefully I'll see some of you next year. <laughs>